Um, I first preached this sermon, I don't know, it's been quite a long time ago. I think it was in a January, um, which might ring a bell with some of you, and it's entitled Spiritual Lessons from the Game of Football. Most of the time, you know, when, we, when you hear sermons, uh, what we hear are uh, scripture readings and, and then the points are made out of that and then there's some way that we illustrate it to make sense out of it or try to connect the, the dots together. Well, this time I'm going to use the illustration as the main part, which is the game of football. And if you notice in your bulletin, I've got about 10 things there that are fill in the blank that I want to draw your attention to, but they all come from the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to read just a little bit of uh, some of the selections that are, are listed for you. But uh, hopefully it'll be an encouragement for you and maybe it'll fix that uh, need that you have for a little football in your life right now. So uh, we'll get started. When, uh, when we think about what it means to be a Christian, uh, one of the things that Paul talks about in uh, chapter 1, he says that in him we were also chosen. He talks about the fact that we were included in Christ and then that we were marked with the seal of the Spirit. What that means is, and this is number one, that we're all on the same team. As Christians, we're, we're together. Um, I don't know if you understand this, but you were actually drafted. If you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, He chose you. You didn't choose Him. You're not a walk-on. He chose you. And because He chose you, you were placed in Christ, which means that you're added to the team. Um, and that because you're on the team, you were given a jersey. Who, who are we representing today? You know, uh, I have to admit, when I grew up in Florida, I was a Dolphins fan when I grew up. Um, and then, um, this was in the 60s and 70s, so hopefully you can forgive me, right? Uh, later on, it was the Cowboys. They were good team back then, you know, um, but quite honestly, and it's been this way for a long time, I, I love the Chiefs and, and all that they are and the heritage that they've had, and uh, it's been a great thing, but just to be quite honest with you, I'm really a baseball fan, so that's my first sport, okay, but uh, we, the, these concepts work no matter what. We're all on the same team together. And I want to tell you about our team just a little bit, okay? We have a jersey, and it's called the Holy Spirit. We all have it. We all wear it. It identifies us together. And that's what he says, that we were sealed in him. We have a, a seal of the Holy Spirit upon us. And this seal actually helps us to identify with one another so that we know who's on the team and who isn't. And because of that, one of the things that you need to remember is that this team, and I appreciate the way Chad mentioned it, this team has a winning heritage. We are a team of winners. We have, from the very beginning, we have winners. And we can go through and name names. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jeremiah, Moses. We can just go on and on and on and on. Paul, Peter, Barnabas, Silas, all of these people are on the team. All of these people are part of our heritage, and that places us on this team together. Number two, every player contributes to the team's success. Uh, in chapter 2, verse 10 in Ephesians, it says that we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. It says that the whole body grows and builds itself up as each part does its work. I want you to think about a team for a little bit. Most of the time when we think of teams, especially professional sporting teams, we always think of the stars. And we think of, the, we know them by name. And we, we think about how great they are and what they do. They're skilled players and, and they're, you know, in football, they're the quarterbacks, the receivers, um, sometimes the running backs and uh, the safeties and, uh, you know, linebackers. We get to know those people by name because they do great things. And, and they're the ones that everyone talks about. But the truth is, there are a lot of people that contribute to a team winning a championship. There are people that are on the practice team that they play against. 
when they're running and working on plays. There are bench players who very rarely get in the game, but when they do get in the game, they're extremely important. There are some of the specialty teams. When I first preached this sermon, it was in Montana, and there was a famous picture in Montana from the 1995 uh, NCAA Division II Championship where the Montana Grizzlies, the kicker, kicked a winning field goal. And it was a picture of the stadium and him kicking. How many times have you ever laughed when a kicker tries to tackle someone or a punter tries to tackle someone? You look at these people and say, I know they're athletes, but they're not like the other guys on the team. But the guy who kicks the winning field goal as time runs out is part of the team. The other people who even down to the water boy, I guess today they're water people and water ladies and others, but they're all important. Everybody contributes. The coaches in the booth, all of these people contribute to the team's success. If our local team that we call Grace Church is going to be successful, if we're going to win the battles that we're in, we all have to contribute, every one of us, not just the stars, the people that you might know, the people that you recognize, but every person is important. And we need to understand that and recognize that because what you are and who you are as part of this team makes, it, makes you very important, and we can't minimize that. The third thing that I want to mention to you is that the team must continue to improve. Any team that's worth its salt is never finished improving. They work and they work and they work. And many times the championship teams are the ones who make the improvements in the last minutes. I don't know if you're watching any of the March Madness, uh, but we spent a lot of years up in Montana. And so one of the teams that I like to follow in college basketball is Gonzaga. And they played last night, and they played against Memphis, and they just about lost the game. They were down 10 points in, at the end of the half. And when they came out, it was like a whole other team came out. One player in particular scored the first 11 points for the Zags. It was pretty incredible. What happened? They improved at halftime. And what happens for us, uh, the, the, the scripture that I uh, referred to here uh, says that we're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people. We're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. The whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. For this reason, what we need to do is to strengthen, be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit. We need to have power together with all of the saints to grasp how wide and long and deep and high is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that you might be filled to the measure of the fullness of Christ. Boy, that's a lot of words, isn't it? What's he saying? You need to keep improving and growing Every one of us as Christians are growing. One of the, the, the terms that we use here at Grace is next steps. We all have a next step. If you just came to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've just made that decision to turn away from the destructiveness of sin in your life and put your trust in Jesus and experience a new life, if that's where you are, your next step is pretty clear where you need to go. You begin to grow. You need to know what the Bible says. You need to understand how to live as a Christian, how to be a Christian mom or dad or whatever it is that your place in life is. But as I look around, I see some that are my age and older. We still have next steps. I'm still working on my own next steps. If this team is going to be successful if we're going to be championship caliber followers of Christ, the team must continue to improve and grow. And what I would do is challenge you to say, do you know what your next step is? Do you know what it is in your old nature that needs to still be put away? Do you know what it is about the Holy Spirit that you need to take on those qualities and grow? 
You know, if you go to a football team and you ask them, what are you working on? They can tell you. If you go to a baseball team and you ask them, what are you working on individually? You talk to the players. They'll tell you what they're working on. They know their next steps. Why is it as Christians we don't always know our next steps? Sometimes it's because it really doesn't seem to be that important to us. And I think the, the fourth point that I want to mention to you maybe hints at this. Why we don't really know our next step and think about it. Number four is that the team has no idea how successful we can be. I'm pretty sure that most of us don't really know what we can actually do together as believers in Christ. The scripture says in uh, chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, he says, now to, listen carefully to these words. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. I want you to think about that. God can do more than you and I can ask or imagine. What does that tell me? It tells me we have no idea how successful we can be. We have no idea what God can do through us if we'll just make the commitment to be a good team member, to do our best. There's no end to what we can do. Jesus told the disciples, this was in John chapter 14, he said, the things you have seen me do, you can do, and greater because I go to the Father. That's pretty incredible when you think about it. What all did Jesus do? And we can do those things and greater? We have no idea how successful we can be. We have no idea what can really take place. Can you imagine that independence could change from having the old reputation of being the meth capital of the world to becoming the spiritual center of Missouri? Is it possible? I just imagined it. You just imagined it. He can do more than we can ask or imagine. So what is it going to take? Well, one of the things I want you to be aware of is that the team owner, this is number five, the team owner has provided player coaches. What's a player coach? See, I told you, you know, a long time ago, uh, I watched football like in the 60s before some of you were even born, maybe even through some of your parents weren't even born by then. Gosh, I feel old. I better sit down. <laughs> the Dallas Cowboys had a guy named Dan Reeves. When Dan Reeves was on the team, he was a player coach. He fulfilled both roles. He was a player on the team, but he also had responsibility of coaching other people. He was one of the last player coaches. We have player coaches. We have, as he says in Ephesians, he talks about the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Why do we have a pastor? Why do we have staff people? Why do we have church leaders? What is their job? They're player coaches. They're, they play in the game with us. We're all together in this as a team. But they're also to coach us and to help us and to encourage us and help us to grow and to, to set an example and to inspire and sometimes to correct. And those things aren't always comfortable. And it's pretty easy if you are a player coach to be criticized because you're not playing your best either. We need to understand that God has provided these player coaches, these people that God, he's placed in our lives as part of our church family, that they're to help us to grow so that we can reach the fullness of what we really could be. We can reach our real potential. I don't know about you, but I've been walking with the Lord for a long time, and one of the things that I want to do is I want my life to be, have an impact in other people's lives. I want to see people love Jesus and grow in him more than anything in my life. That, that's the number one thing. 
And I realize that is something that the Holy Spirit has put in me. And so I would like to be a player coach too. I would like to be able to encourage people. And as often as I have opportunity, I want to share with people and encourage them. But the game of football teaches us that, that we need to understand those things and where we are and where we're going. Number six, success is the result of growth and practice. Growth and practice. What this section of scripture tells us is that we need to put off old things and put on new things. I want you to think about what do football players do at practice? Well, I know the obvious answer is they practice. What do they practice? What are they doing? They're working on skills. They're working on doing things and creating muscle memory and being able to understand how to run plays and what everybody else is doing together. And, and practice is not fun. Practice is, is discouraging and frustrating and it's hot and you have to do things over and over and over again. And nobody wants to do that. I'm here to be a star. Come on. I'm here to dance in the end zone. I think I'm going to practice my end zone dance. I won't do that for you because you will leave. <laughs> but that's how stars maybe think. But the truth is you will never get to dance in the end zone if you don't grow and practice and get rid of the old habits and work together as a team. Practice means working on the game plan. Okay, let's go back to the church. Do you know the game plan? What's the game plan for Easter? See, we have a game plan. Yeah, we're going to have a helicopter and we're going to have candy. And what's all that about? It's really about let's do things that will attract people to come and to be a part of what we're doing on that day so that they can really hear about who Jesus is and how he is so much better than the life that they're living right now. Amen. Isn't that the game plan? Okay. And so because we need that game plan and we're going to put it into practice, we need help for getting other people to do things. Okay. So we need people that will be able to help with the candy and say hi to the kids. And if nothing else, stand out there and smile at people. You see, it's all part of the game plan. But many of us, are maybe introverts, and we're not real comfortable doing that. We really don't know that we want to talk to new people. But I want you to know, if you are on this team, and you wear the jersey of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit wants to smile at people through you. That's part of what we want to work on, and we want to practice. And we need to work on these things and improve. Nobody likes practice, but we all want to be a star. We want to see people come to know Jesus, and we want to see families healed, and we want to see our community become more Christ-like in, in all that we are. But that's not going to happen if we don't do our part. And many times, our part is the practice. Okay, the legendary coach Tom Landry was asked, what's a coach do? What's your job? He said, my job is to make men do what they don't want to do in order that they can do what they've dreamed of doing all their lives. Do you get that? That's pretty strong, isn't it? In other words, what he was saying, my job is to make them practice and to do it right so that they can play it in the game and win and ultimately get to a Super Bowl. That's my job. And you see, the Holy Spirit has a job. The player coaches in the church have a job. The difference is you're not under contract, so we can't say you're fired if you don't do your job. But the truth is it grieves the Spirit of God when we don't do our job. It quenches the fire of the Holy Spirit in our fellowship when we don't do our job. We need to understand that success is the result of growth and practice, and it's important that you do those things. They're not always fun, but in the end, it makes a difference. John Wooden, have you ever heard of John Wooden, the great collegiate basketball coach from UCLA? They won, what was it, 12 championships? 
11 championships under his influence, he said championships are won on the practice court. And it's important to recognize that because many of us aren't willing to make a little effort to be the champions that Jesus has called us to be. And you know why? We'll go back to number four. You have no idea how successful we can be. You have no idea what we can do, what you can do when you let the Holy Spirit work in your life. Number seven, teams that don't get along don't win. Right? Doesn't matter the level of talent. It doesn't matter the, how hard they work on the practice field. It doesn't matter what their internal motivations are. The truth is teams that don't get along together don't win. It's the same for churches. It's the same for local churches. If we don't get along with one another, we're not going to be successful. If we don't learn to put into practice all of those love one another verses and actually use them and put them into play in our lives and do that on a daily, regular basis, we will not be successful because that's the way the game plan works. One of the things that this passage says is don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Have you ever gone home or gone out to eat after church and had roast Joey? You know what I'm talking about? Well, I can't believe he talked about that today. You know, a lot of churches do that. There are people many times in churches that will just eat their pastors alive. They'll eat their other, it's gossip and it's backbiting and it's all those things. That destroys the team. We need to know, and I'm, I, I'm ignorant enough, I haven't been here long enough, I don't know what anybody says about anybody. <laughs> but I'm just saying, we need to be careful because as a team, we need to be unified. That's what makes the difference. Number eight, what you do off the field does matter. This whole big section, I'm not going to read any of it, but it's addressed to wives and husbands, children and parents, slaves and masters, which would be like employers and employees. And basically what it talks about is that what you do in private in your family makes a difference in the life of the church. What you do off the field matters. One of the things that I just recently read a book by John Wooden, which is why he's on my mind, um, but uh, he, he always had his guys dress up. Whenever they traveled, they dressed nicely. Um, and you've seen this before, and a lot of professional athletes these days still do this. They dress nicely when they go, and, and sometimes it's for show, to draw attention to themselves. But there is something that goes on off the court that affects what goes on the court or off the field and it affects on the field. It's that idea of a lazy attitude. When we have a lazy attitude and we say, well, what I do over here doesn't matter, you know, as long as I'm decent at church, it'll be okay. But that's not true. What we do off the field matters. It has an impact on what we do. A lot of teams have mandatory team meetings. They have diets they have to follow. They have curfews. They have dress codes of how they wear things. It's, it's amazing what professional sports especially will do. Why do they do all of that? Because it matters. Once I just start slipping in one area in my life, pretty soon other things start slipping. Have you ever noticed that? Satan is really smart. He knows how to attack us. He doesn't just come in and, and just, you know, usually lambast us and knock us down. He usually just eats away at us little by little. And he starts with the little things of, the, of my attitude and my actions and all the little things, and it grows and it grows and it grows. John Wooden said that he had noticed before that when players began to slack off on, on the things off the court, you could see it in their play on the court. Do you think that there's things in our lives that we as Christians let slip? That we just let it go and we don't really do anything with it? 
and pretty soon we have compromised. Pay attention to those little things because what you do off the field does matter. Number nine, good equipment helps our confidence. This is the passage in Ephesians that talks about the armor of God, truth, righteousness, readiness, faith, um, salvation, the word of God, prayer, being alert. This, God has provided equipment for us, spiritual equipment that helps us to have confidence. And that confidence is something that's, that's pretty incredible. When I was in high school, there was a, a guy that I knew, his name was Greg Jeffcoat. And uh, he was a running back. And, uh, you know, I, I, you, you might find this hard to believe, but back in high school, I, I was not the, the athlete that I am today. And, and so I was watching, not participating in football, but Greg Jeffcoat really always impressed me because he, as a running back, he would always take the ball, bend his head, and run full speed through a hole. And if there was somebody there, he'd run right into him, head first. And it always impressed me how much he trusted his helmet and his shoulder pads to protect him. Do you trust what God's given you? Do you trust that he's going to protect you? See, I think that's one of the issues that we have is that we're not willing to take a risk because we really don't trust the equipment that we have. We don't trust what he's given to us. And so with that lack of confidence, we don't do anything. There was a guy, and this has been going on for a long time, but in the 20s, this guy um, was working on uh, a, a vest. I'll show you the picture of it. See, do you think that guy has confidence in his work? Do you see what that is? That is a policeman with a pistol in his hand aiming at the man who says, I've invented a bulletproof vest. Yeah, there's more pictures of this, that, of, of them shooting at each other. Tell me how confident you are. Okay, shoot me. That's pretty confident. Now, if he can be confident in that, why can't we be confident in what God has provided for us? You ever wonder about that? This is one of those things that really hits home with me. Do I really trust the Lord? Do I trust the Lord enough to tell the truth when I need to? When I'm called on to do it, when it's going to be uncomfortable? Do I trust the Lord that I'm going to act righteously no matter what? Even when people aren't looking, even when it's off the field, am I going to do the right thing? How much do we trust? That jersey, the Holy Spirit, he's the one that provides the protection. And we need to have great confidence. One of the things I've learned over the years is that if I will do the practice that in some ways for me in this area means reading the scriptures, getting familiar with the Bible, getting to know it pretty well. If I'll do my part in that practice, which isn't always fun, sometimes I have to make a sacrifice. Sometimes I have to say no to something that maybe I want to do in order to do something that I really need to do. But when I make the effort to do that and practice and get to know God's word, and then I'm off somewhere and talking to somebody and they start telling me something, I all of a sudden in my mind have things that I can say to them. Because the Holy Spirit brings those things to my mind. And I remember, and I can say something. That's part of how this team works. And the truth is, as Chad mentioned, we're going to win. This war is really over. We're going to win. The question is, am I going to win the battle that I'm in? Because I want you to know, you can lose the battle. It's possible to lose the battle by a lack of preparation, by a lack of determination, unwilling to make sacrifices. If we do those things, we can literally lose the battles that we're in. The war is going to be won. 
But what about that battle that you're in? The battle for your family, the battle for your friends, the battle for our community, the battle for our church, the battle for reaching people for Christ. We should have confidence in the good equipment that God has provided for us and take advantage of it. The last thing I'll mention, number 10, even the stars need help. Even the stars need help. This was the great apostle Paul. I mean, in, in Christian circles, do you get much better than Paul? I mean, isn't he like the Patrick Mahomes of the New Testament? Okay. This is what he said. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. He said it twice. Pray for me that I won't be afraid to share the gospel. The stars need help. What would Patrick Mahomes be without linemen? He'd probably be a puddle in the middle of the field, right? Everyone needs a supporting cast. Even the stars need help, the skilled players. I was, we were talking, I was visiting with Joey, and we were talking about childcare and some of those kinds of things, and I told him, I, I remember once that I was pastoring in a smaller church, and one Sunday morning, some people came to me that were kind of taking care of kids and stuff, and they came and said, we can't get anybody to work in the nursery. I said, huh, okay. So I went down to the nursery, picked up one of the babies, walked up to the front of the church and said, holding the baby, and I said, we need some help in the nursery today, and if you guys don't want to do it, I'll go do it. Well, needless to say, because I was the pastor, I got a bunch of volunteers, right? Think about that. We have a great pastor. He preaches the word to us. He's genuine. He loves us. He wants to reach out and help as many people in our community as he can. But I want you to know he can't do it by himself. It takes all of us to go back to that whole thing. It's, it's a team effort. We're all in this together. And believe it or not, you might be a Want somebody that's on the practice team, but if you don't do your job really well, you can affect the outcome of a game. You can affect how a battle goes. There was a guy that wrote a book, and it was entitled, Why Men Hate Going to Church. And the premise was basically that in most churches, we have become feminized and there's nothing that really challenges a man. I mean, what's a man going to do? What's the big challenge of being a man? Taking the offering or, you know, saying hello to a stranger? Well, the truth of the matter is there's a lot of things that we miss out on because we don't understand how successful the team can be and the sacrifices that it takes to get there. I appreciate what Chad mentioned last week about men being warriors. We need spiritual warriors. We need men who are willing to sacrifice, who are going to work hard on and off the field, who are going to make a difference. Because the truth is, you know, if, if you goof off and you lose a game, it's not fun. But spiritually, if we lose, it has eternal consequences. One person I read said that the ultimate manliness is godliness. I've worked with cops, detention officers, firemen, ambulance crews, and I've seen them. They run toward danger, not away from it. They're strong, they're brave, they're determined, they work hard at doing things, they're skilled at what they do. 
But one of the strongest things that a man can do is to love his family, to go against the flow of what our culture says, and be who Jesus called him to be. We wear a jersey, the Holy Spirit. We have a winning tradition, but we don't want to be the losers. We can very well lose the battle for our community, for our family, for our friends, if we don't do our part. One of the things that I have always been challenged by with professional athletes is if they're willing to make that kind of sacrifice for a trophy, why don't Christians make a sacrifice for something that's eternal? What is it that we struggle with? It always challenged me to look at my own life, say, what are my values? What's really important to me? Which would you rather have, the Lombardi Trophy? Or would you like to hear someone say, well done, good and faithful servant? The answer to that question really reflects your values, what's important to you. Our community is dying and people are going to hell on a regular basis here. They're destroying themselves with alcohol, drugs, crazy philosophies, all kinds of things that are self-destructive lifestyles. We're their only hope. We're their hope. If we don't point them to Jesus and help them, if we're not willing to work at it, make sacrifices and do the right thing, what's going to happen? 